Welcome to Cultures of Africa, the brand new DLC that's just launched for humankind today. I'm going to jump in. Thanks to Amplitude for giving me one day's early access to get around my awkward New Zealand time zone. If you'd like to see more humankind strategy games and cultures of Africa, look no further than right here. But I'm not going to waste any more of your time. It's a very exciting day. Let's explore, showcase, new gameplay of all six new cultures to humankind. This is actually a half decent turn one. Uh, I am playing on normal uh, settings for me, which is humankind difficulty. Playing on fast speed today, just to make sure that I can get into the cultures. But I didn't want to play on Blitz because it kind of messes with it a bit too much. Uh, this looks like a very good starting territory. We are, of course, going to be looking for the Bantu for era number one. I'm going to need to find enough food first, though. Okay, so for the duration of this game, I think we'll go with the tried and true plus one industry per population on cities. And it looks like we can move through. First and foremost, it's Bantu, baby. Bantu, plus two influence per number of adjacent empires on territory. Okay. And their outposts automatically upgrade and their pioneers are super unique. I'm going to grab them most likely, but I might just hang around for one more turn. You've got to get in quick. Let's take the Bantu and explore what they do. So their unique unit, the Pioneer, is a nomad. Much like uh, some other cultures that already exist in the game, this unit, including the Neolithic era units, gathers food through fighting and ransacking to multiply. It's also a Pioneer, so it connects, collects unique curiosities. The really interesting thing about these units is that unlike normal units in humankind, they can't found an outpost unless there's four of them in the army. This is quite unique. Let's see. I reckon if we jump down onto this river with both of them, it'll waste their turns, but we will get an extra one to pop out the back and send over... Ooh. And there's lots of fighting to do. Okay, let's break up into two units and see what we can sort of nomadically pioneer and scavenge from this land. Okay, okay. Our special curiosities appear to be popping up all over the place. There is so much food here. I'm going to just literally run around and grab it all. And now we have four units. So we can try out the brand new pioneer's ability. Which territory do I want to grab? Woof! The little bit of extra combat strength, because I'm kind of thinking as if these units are essentially uh, Neolithic era units, but their extra combat strength is granted weaker than most units in the era, but much stronger, of course, than the Neolithic era unit that they sort of replace. Well, as I said before, these four are ready, so let's smash down an outpost with them and see how we can interact with it. It looks like about a 212 or a 214 is, is uh, as good as we're going to get. So we'll grab this 214. Boom. You can also found a religion instantly. That's an interesting interaction. Something to do with population crossing over a threshold. Let's go plus six faith on main plaza. And now, as you can see, what we can actually do is bring the units back out. So when we're playing as the Bantu, we're not using our influence to summon or make outposts appear. To build outposts, I should say. But what we can do is use our four units to create it, and then spend influence to bring them back out. I don't know if this is the right move, but I feel like they are so good, their unique curiosities, their extra food that they get from hunting, that we should bring them back out of the outposts. Okay, so another super easy fight one. You can see I'm getting all of my food and influence from fighting and scavenging. Also gaining some extra units and really taking no losses along the way. Founding Myths and Founding Plaza, the early civics, relatively easy to unlock with the Bantu because of all of these ludicrous discoveries uh, and food and everything. Woof! Uh, I'm going to use the single unit to grab the scientific ones and then send the armies around to scavenge the food. Hopefully, to grow big and strong. Oh, would you look at that. Holy moly. This reminds me of early humankind, where the Neolithic era rewarded a lot more. But don't forget, we're actually in the ancient era right now. So it is a little bit different. I've got so many units. I'm constantly having to separate them, uh, merge them in with other armies, 
split them out to grab all of the different discoveries. It's fantastic. Oh my god. Even the woolly mammoths are no match for us, and they yield so much food and influence that we should just be able to keep this gravy train rolling. Okay, we're going to have to use another four to place down an outpost. That is, of course, the downside. But look at this upside. <laughs> the downside is we're going to have to use them up. I really don't think it's the end of the world. Uh, we'll grab this territory because it's next to the capital. It's got a whole load of resources, even though its yields aren't super fantastic. I've got loads of influence, though, because I'm not really spending it, uh, which means, actually, coincidentally, that new cities are easier to create because we're not spending any influence on building outposts. So what I might do is that costs 80. Let's bring one unit back out and then turn it into a city, a city with three population, of course, because I only chose to bring one unit out. Get everybody working hard. Let's see if we can snowball this even further as the great tide spreads down the map. And because I'm producing these units so dang quickly, we can actually move down here and grab a super juicy territory. I won't quite be able to turn this one immediately into a city, but we do have enough influence to muster some units back out of it again and continue our great march south. More and more discoveries along the way. I think, actually, I almost have so many units that it might be worth just pumping some back into the cities to start filling up some of these jobs. So I might just start slowly and carefully disbanding units in to fill up these jobs, grow these cities. We can, of course, also do my favourite trick of all time and utilise our units to provide an extra, what, 20 industry to the city per turn by chopping down unutilised forests? Sounds good to me! These four marauders are going to boop, convert themselves into an outpost, convert themselves into some horses, pump one back out, and merge. Merging is very smooth. Very smooth. These units are just farming in the in the fog of war. If you don't know, in the fog of war in humankind, the parts of the map you can't see, uh, curiosities, discoveries can spawn. And I'm having an absolute field day with them right now. Maybe I convert these four into another outpost this era. Keep building outposts with influence. Removing the need to farm it any other way. Okay, boom. Founding this outpost means that I've conquered Pavo. So, eat that Pavo. But more importantly, um, <laughs> I've sort of completed this era. The other reason why I reckon I've probably completed the era as the Bantu is because I've conquered this whole island and I can't get across the water until I move through to the next era to get trade expeditions technology. So, I am a little bit limited. I've explored as far as I can. Let's now, even though we haven't quite finished all the stars, move through into era number two. I'm incredibly excited to get there before the other players in the game as well. It is Garamantes leading us through into the classical era. What do they do? Well, let me tell you. Plus five influence on main plaza if a city is growing. Again, we're receiving some influence generation here with the Bantu. It was from having adjacent empires. Haven't quite managed to really get a lot out of that yet. But now we're incentivized for growing our cities. And this district, the Fogara, I theorize is going to be very strong. We don't have a lot of sterile terrain. There's a little bit. We'll see. Let's jump in and choose the Garabantes taking us through into the classical era. And what? What? An outstanding outfit. Okay, what would benefit us? Seen as we're on our own island, I figure we may as well go with the plus two food on coastal water and lakes. We are also, of course, remember, rewarded for having our cities grow. We get more influence if our cities are growing. So food is going to be very important for us. Let's grab that. Use our religion to help us get a little bit of food. Okay, here we go. The Forgara. What has it got in store for me? Plus three food by default. Two on sterile terrain. One on rocky and stony fields. Traditionally, uh, tiles, of course, that favour industry. And two influence on emblematic district. That is from my civics. 17. Okay. Okay. The beauty, of course, of this district is we can place it wherever we like. This allows us to grow our cities in much more fluid ways moving forward. So there is some benefit in placing it up here 
uh, even though it's not the highest yield, because I'll be able to build districts around it. However, down here it's the same. I mean, you can see there's a few luxuries. This looks like a really good spot, actually. It's a pretty generic spot, like it's not taking advantage of sterile terrain, but we can do that later. Let's build this here for 17 food, and actually we'll get another one up there, because of course we can build one in every territory. So why hold back? Let's just spam them out far and wide. I am, of course, though, just thinking a little bit about strategic spots. For example, if I wanted to build near these horses, I could place this district here and be able to, at least in part, build near it. Mm, I think we'll just go with the best yields right now. Willing to build one there, though, to get some good uh, potential build spots up here in future. Cool. Got a couple of territories to attach as well, but I'll get some harbors here to get some f- ah! What the heck is going on here? How is a classical era harbor with no previous harbors giving me 42 food? All of these coastal tiles, thanks to my religion and my food generating abilities. Woof. When you get those harbors online really quickly, are the rest the rest aren't that good, but I think they're good enough to bring to the front of the queue. Okay, so I really need to be careful to make sure that I'm filling up my farmer's jobs here with Garamante. Because of course, we don't get that plus five influence, Desert and Bloom. We don't get that extra influence generation unless our cities are actually growing. So I need to keep these cities growing. Oh, this is a very interesting one. So we've just set foot on an uninhabited continent first, which is interesting. Uh, and I've got my four units left over from the Bantu era. So we can claim a territory without spending influence if that's something that excites us. Um, and I've also just found some sterile terrain. This is of course snowy, not desert. I'm assuming it works the same regardless because it's coded the same, but we'll find out. Are the Garamantes secretly a snowy culture? I'm not sure, but we're going to send them up the top of this hill and claim a new promised land. And because we've claimed them without spending influence, again, their legacy lives on. Uh, I can just turn this immediately into a new city. Uh, question is, do I want to? Let me just check. Am I close to it? No, we're so far away from feudalism. Let's do it. Boom. And let's use our agrarian ability to attract three more people into the city. Love it. And then, a new district. Yes, look! Sterile terrain! It works! We can harvest previously useless tiles using this awesome district. And look at that! Boom! Food is here. And previously uninhabited land. In this case, it's snowy. I imagine the cultures of Africa intended to have more of a desert theme to them. However, I'll take it. That is freaking awesome. The downside, of course, to this legacy is that when I'm trying to explore with just one unit, I can't claim territories. I physically cannot claim them with these units. So upsides to playing Bantu previously, but also downsides to playing them. Bantu polytheism is going absolutely nuts. Let's feed in more into our harbour and give them another plus five food. This will ensure that we keep growing so that we can get maximum influence. You can see now 15 influence per turn from Desert in Bloom. Doesn't compare to the amount that I'm generating from my districts thanks to Liberty, but it's a nice little bonus and it'll keep going the more we move and grow. Hey, I note also that this has changed in the recent patch update. Nice little change to the strategic and luxuries. Makes a big difference to the user experience, I reckon. The good news is that the Bantu's unique unit upgrades perfectly into the Garamantes one, they're on the same line. You can see here that my Pioneer can be upgraded into the Javelin Rider. What does it do? Well, it's a ranged unit with six movement and three range that can move after firing. This is a powerful boy. Yeah, gonna grab one of these. Also, of course, has the added benefit of being a standard unit in humankind. So I can now pop back across and take that territory without it needing four of them like I did with the Pioneers. I wonder if the stone hinge is inadvertently buffed in this update because the cultures of Africa synergize and favor really well with food. Although I note that they don't really do anything at all to faith. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. I should probably just take the mausoleum of Helicarnassus and call it a day. 
Okay, I've got so much influence I could consider getting another new city, if you can believe that. Uh, stuff it, let's do it. Boom. More districts. More food. More power. Boom. Thank you, Bantu polytheism. Still going strong. Industry and food. I've also just pumping out a couple extra javelin riders so that we can start to explore this new world and see what it has to offer, i.e. spend all of our influence to take everything. Seeing as we do love farmers and food and growing cities, let's get plus one farmers slot per farmers quarter. Nationalize industries will be a huge part of a Cultures of Africa playthrough, I reckon. Double check just to make sure everybody's still growing, growing strong. You can of course hover over the top here to see how much you're getting from Desert and Bloom, and that will tell you uh, how many cities are producing it, right? Each city produces five, so in this case it's four times five. I know that all of my cities are growing. That is very cool, right? So all of our techs moving through have got these, these little movies. That's sick. That's really cool. These Garamante riders, even if you put their military power aside, which they are fairly strong, are fantastic scouts. They're such a good natural upgrade from the Bantu, uh, because they just go straight through the same promotion track. You can upgrade them instantly, relatively cheaply, and spam out your outposts far and wide, of course taking advantage of their huge movements per turn. And here is another piece of sterile terrain for me to take advantage of. <laughs> Oh, these new territories are freaking awesome. I just used all of my influence to basically clock the game and completely finish that territory. Hook it up to this city and now we're really away laughing. Get another one of our uniques down. Another 16 food. Don't mind if I do. Oh my goodness, look at this. And our final, probably one of our last turns as the Garamantes. I'm just setting up some new territories. And they are ridiculous. They are wonderful, they are ridiculous, and they are so powerful. I can just move across them like there's no tomorrow. Nobody can stop me claiming one per turn. Two per turn? Sure. Brilliant. These harbours are, um... I mean, <laughs> you definitely have to write home to mum about them. These are insane. Attach another territory. 22 food district. When there's not sterile terrain, it's worth noting it's still a very good food district. Better than the average by quite a long margin. Uh, and because I'm growing so much, believe it or not, we've actually completed our religion already. What is going on? What? Okay. Oh, it just keeps getting better and better and better. There's Victoria Falls, another outpost under my control. Look at this as again, I use the power of the Gramantes ability, building off the Bantu that we've already played, using all of my influence at my disposal to just pump out really, really powerful territories. So let's not miss out on the hottest new culture to drop in the medieval era. It's none other than the Swahili. We're playing as a merchant culture now, it's important to note, so our objectives will change a bit. What do they do? Plus 10 stability on harbour. Oh, what a lucky coincidence that is. And plus 10 stability on harbours per adjacent regular district. Wicked. We're also getting a unique harbour. The Bandari counts as a farmer's and market quarter, providing three money per number of unique types of resources available. We've got a lot of those. Uh, and some other generic benefits that we're getting off the empire as well. Their unique ship is a naval nimble transport craft. Very good. Let's try the Swahili. The new humankind merchant culture in the medieval era. Okay, let's have a look and see what the Swahili harbour has to offer. Remembering that we've already got some very powerful harbours. Look, I'm getting three food from coastal tiles thanks to my religion. Right, where do, wow. What? Okay, this is good. No, I'm not removing the harbor, you fool. Yeah, these things are pretty cool. Um, take a look at this one here. Synergies from adjacent district, plus 20 stability. Whew! 
We need to build these in areas where we've already built up some infrastructure. We also, of course, need to coastal tiles it though. So sometimes we have to just settle for, you know, that one there that produced a whole load of science. Or this one here that's netting an additional 10 influence. This one here's got 20 stability because it's next to a harbour. Likewise, this one here. 19 food, 36 gold, 20 stability, and 10 influence. Are you kidding me? Oh, of course, and because it's a harbour, oh my god. No. Because the Swahili's unique harbour is a harbour, uh, I can build it on all of these new territories that I've just picked up. And then what I can do is smash down a normal harbour next to it. Even if the yields aren't as good, I can ensure that there's an adjacent district. In fact, there's going to be three because of that builder's zone. Wow. That has to be one of the greatest outposts built of all time. Jeepers. We need to save up for an additional city here. Yeah, I think it's pretty safe to say that if you're playing a naval build and you want another option to the Norse, i.e. you don't want to play a militarist culture in this era, uh, the Swahili are the obvious choice. I mean, look at this. This is indicative of a somewhat average harbour. It's not giving me any stability, but it's giving me great yields elsewhere. But of course I can force it to give me stability by building this harbour next door. So good. I think I'm in love in Swahili. The other interaction that is important to remember is that when you're boosting your stability, you're also inadvertently boosting your influence. As cities under 90% stability will start to produce half as much influence as they normally would. Below 30% and you're looking at sweet FA. What that means is that while these are providing influence, while we're spending influence rather to get food and money and so on, Really, the net benefit is actually much more extreme. Watch, I'll place down a 32 food harbour here, and then, I don't know, 17 food, 42 gold, 10 stability, and 10 influence harbour there. <laughs> that will keep stability high, and that will enable me to basically ensure that I never fall below on it, and I keep my influence high as well. I think the Swahili are an absolute freaking powerhouse and my huge influence generation, movement, map negotiation and influence is allowing me to expand and expand and expand and expand and literally, literally give no ifs about it. And while the Swahili don't have a unique unit, we do benefit from their embarkment, disembarkment, basically all of our units will <laughs> not be as strong as a normal naval unit in the sea, but for those of you who know a little bit about humankind, you'll know that this unit, which has about 30 combat strength, having 22 while it's mounted, and of course, having all of these other extra abilities like embarking for free, moving for free, or a slight increase on our movement, uh, does allow us to control the seas, not in a military way, but if someone does fight us, we have a pretty good chance at holding our own as well. Really, really happy with the power of the Swahili here. The only downside I would say to the Swahili is because their harbours and outposts and expansionizing is so good, I'm struggling to save up enough influence to build a city. But it's growing every turn. Alrighty, so we've found the Greeks were immediately being fought. And we're dead. Cool.